Today we're welcoming Chet Villa. Chet is from Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Chet worked with us to develop the guidance that was submitted to the FDA on September 30th. Welcome, Chet. Thank you so much, Pat. So we embarked on this guidance um, last September of 2021 and thought, well, this will be easy um, and relatively short. We learned that it wasn't easy and it was a much heavier lift from the earlier guidance that we developed. So Chet, you served on the steering committee and led the cardiac guidance. Can you talk about how you thought about that and perhaps the colleagues that you you included in developing the piece of the cardiac part, part of this guidance? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. I think that's it, that's exactly right. I think like most things, when when we when we start to think about it, we're like, oh, this is easy. We do this every day, all day long. This will be this will be relatively simple. And then as we really started to think about the complexities um, of this and the sheer volume of data that's starting to come in, we went, whoa, whoa, baby, and that's all in a very good way. I would have said from a cardiac perspective, ten or fifteen years ago the data was really limited. So if we would have tried to do this 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been pretty simple and it would have been actually a, an embarrassingly short document from a cardiac perspective. Over the last 10 to 15 years, we've started to really build the community. We've started to understand a lot more about how things progress from a cardiac perspective. And as a result, trying to condense that um, into a manageable document and show where we're evolving, what we're understanding now, and where we might go, I think ended up being a challenge. Um, and a good one, but, but a challenge nonetheless. And to be able to try and address some of those um, and make it a usable document and to reflect where things are and where we expect them to go on their current trajectory over the next two to five years required, I think, some of the, the brightest minds we have from cardiology. So that included a number of collaborators, um, and we worked together to try and find something uh, and to find agreement where we could on how to approach this from a clinical perspective um, and from a research perspective and to look for what we know now and what we think is going to be very important over the coming years before the next guidance. So it's hard for parents, you know, as we as we as I find that often information is condensed into phrases or small, you know, small bits. And then we look at those small bits and then weigh it against our, our own knowledge or our own fears many, in many cases. And so you are condensing all this knowledge. And we talk about strain on cardiac MRI and then we talk about ejection fraction. But how do you how do you marry those two things? How do you connect the dots between strain and the predictive, you know, will that heart fail and in what time will that heart fail? I think this is one of the regulatory issues that that the FDA, for, for as a matter of fact, is struggling with. If you're giving a drug, how do we know it works? And what are you looking at to be able to identify that? Right. So I, I think I'll even take a step back to say, okay, how do you, how do patients who have heart failure or cardiomyopathy, especially dilated cardiomyopathy, where the heart um, tends to thin out and become dysfunctional over time. How does how does the FDA usually evaluate how drugs work in that situation? Well, usually that applies to only adults. There have been very few studies in children um, and teenagers at all, independent of dystrophinopathy um, and Duchenne. And um, so for adults, the way that that happens is unfortunately for many adults who get dilated cardiomyopathy and their heart doesn't function, a lot of them do not do well over a two to three year period. That makes doing that clinical study where you can say, do people survive? Do they stay out of the hospital? Relatively simple. You need big numbers to do it, but you can follow people over two to three years because enough people have problems um, when they're adults. We are trying to say a whole different paradigm from a Duchenne perspective. We're taking something similar to what has happened from a, a skeletal muscle perspective, which is we know if we wait until you do not have much in the way of skeletal muscle, starting therapies there is going to have limited benefit. It may have some small ones, but it's not the same as starting steroids, starting exon skipping, starting other things at an earlier age when you still have muscle to keep. So using that paradigm from a Duchenne perspective is a real problem. It's a problem because one, you will already have lost a significant amount of cardiac muscle. And I want to underscore that. You'll have lost cardiac muscle. Time is muscle. And we won't get that back. 
our job is to try and preserve that, okay? And two, the other thing that tends to happen is for a lot of older men who have cardiac dysfunction, they also have respiratory weakness. And to be able to get a study and say, does it make a difference from a cardiac perspective? You have to separate out the boys who don't do well from a lung perspective. And that becomes a real challenge numbers wise, especially if there are a lot of men that have cardiac and lung dysfunction, trying to get enough people to answer that fundamental question later is really challenging. So what we're trying to say is, again, time is muscle, time is muscle, time is muscle. If we take these early markers and we track them over time and they relate to long-term cardiac outcomes, can we use those as surrogate markers, as those early things to track during clinical trials? And then if that seems to make a difference, if we follow those men over time, can we track them and get to that final endpoint that you care about? And that way, we showed those changes and we gave therapeutic benefit to boys who were in their teenagers where we knew they had cardiomyopathy. And then by the time they get into their twenties and thirties, we're starting to see a difference. If we have to wait till the end, I, I think it's a losing battle because we already would have lost a lot of potential therapeutic benefit. And, and I think we got to get them to come around to this idea. It, it is muscle. You are losing muscle as part of the disease, just like in skeletal muscle. And so this is what you're measuring on cardiac MRI. You're looking at muscle, right? That is exactly right. So the first changes that we see are strain, and that's probably the microscopic changes that happen at the muscle level that even the most advanced MRI can't quite pick up. Then what happens is you end up seeing LGE or late gadolinium enhancement, which is that scar and that fat that happens as the heart starts to take more damage. That usually happens on average around 14 or 15 years of age. And then after that, the heart function starts to go down. So if we come back to them and say, hey, we have now had more and more men who've had more MRIs over their time, and we can relate these tissue changes to heart function changes, which then translate to how people do over the long term in terms of hospitalization with heart failure, in terms of passing away from heart disease, and in terms of how they feel. Because it turns out when you have heart failure, to the point where you're struggling to breathe or you're getting swelling in your feet or you're losing weight, all those things that make you feel really crummy. Can we use those over time and relate those to those final outcomes, which do matter? The FDA is absolutely right. We need to be able to hit those endpoints. But if we wait to the point where there's already um, enough tissue loss that those are a problem, the therapeutic benefit won't be there. We have to get it early to affect those long-term outcomes because the tissue is fundamentally changed. You lose cardiac muscle. So if you had to pick, do you think that they should or could accept strain, LGE, or by the time the ejection fraction starts to decline, I'm not sure that it feels like their people are on a cliff when it starts to go below a certain point. What, what would you see them thinking about or at least reasonably accepting as a feel function and survive surrogate? Yep. So I, I think the, the feel part, 100%, how you feel matters. So I think that without a question, I, I don't think there's any um, differences of opinion between them and us. We have to define how that feel is going to be different for Duchenne, right? So the usual way that we classify that from a, from a heart failure perspective is what's called the New York Heart Association classification. The way that it defines how your symptoms progress is what is the relationship of your symptoms to activity? That is fundamental to what happens from a heart failure perspective. That does not apply to 95% of the people I take care of with Duchenne by the time they're heart, they have heart disease. So one, we have to define that and we have to come up with Duchenne specific ones there. I think everyone will be on board there. Two, in terms of how those relate to long out, long-term outcomes, the question about strain, the question about LGE, the question about ejection fraction, I think we have to define that, okay? I this is opinion now at this point, um, the, I think LGE is probably the best answer because that's what's telling us what the, what's happening at the tissue level. And if we're showing fundamental changes at the tissue level that eventually become irreversible, I think that's, that's where we go. If you lose muscle and we can help you keep muscle over the long term, that's gonna be our end point of choice. 
Because with ejection fraction, even though that is that ultimately matters, especially when it gets low, I think everybody here has probably um, gone to their cardiologist and said, you know, one day it's 61%, one day it's 58%, one day it's 64%. It bounces around a lot. That progression of that fibrosis, the fundamental changes that happen at the tissue level, I think that is that is what really matters. And I think as we get more and more understanding of how that progresses, I think they'll come around to that. Again, because if tissue is gone, there is no therapy in the world that's going to affect it if it's no longer muscle and it becomes scar and it becomes fat, which is what happens in the heart and it's what happens in the skeletal muscle. So if they'll accept, so just a little bit more about LGE, um, mm -hmm. you can quantify it and does it in, in and of itself ever um, cause or is associated with any rhythm disturbances? So we're, we're trying to understand that rhythm disturbances actually right now. Um, we, the, the studies that have existed have been relatively limited based on what we know. It does seem to associate with extra heartbeats from the lower chambers of the heart. Now, just having a few extra um, heartbeats from the lower chamber um, is something that all of us may have, whether you have Duchenne or don't have Duchenne, but those the dangerous rhythms or the rhythms that need to be treated that either lead to a sudden cardiac event or lead to you being in the hospital, those are a different ballgame. We're just starting to understand what that means. That will be, I think, potentially um, a, an important endpoint if we can relate, especially the progression of that LGE to the development of those rhythms and the, the fundamental outcomes over time. Based on everything else we know in cardiology, that does appear to be a setup because of what happens is those areas that are no longer cardiac muscle, the electrical signals that tell the heart how to beat have to go around it. And unfortunately, when they have to take a different route than they're supposed to, it can set up the signal to allow those very fast and potentially dangerous rhythms that happen. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but connecting the dots through LGE seems like a reasonable thing to do, and hopefully they will accept it over time. I can't thank you enough for working on the guidance. Can you give us your overall view on the on the whole guidance document and that process and what you feel is useful and beneficial to developing guidance for FDA? Well, I, I think that it's really important because everything that I do from a cardiac perspective when I talk about therapies actually impacts all of those and vice versa. If you think about a, a, a boy or a man or um, a woman who has uh, who is a symptomatic carrier as only their heart, you're missing out on all of these other components of what is changing about the field, how new medications might affect that, and how my own cardiac medications impact those other things. I think you have to think about the patient in front of you as, as, a, as a complete person and that includes how their heart function is doing, how their lung function is doing, how their skeletal muscle function is doing, and how each of those therapies that are coming along might impact one and the other. It turns out we have to understand how things that are being developed from a skeletal muscle perspective impact the heart, how they impact the lungs, because it's all of those things together which determine how good you feel over the long term and how well you do long term. As a physician, do you feel like you're always on a balancing act and trying to, you know, just balance the most appropriate care for this individual? I, I think looking at the person holistically, it must be a difficult job just to make sure you're on the right path, you're on the right track for this individual. So I think it's I think it's hard for us, especially when we're trying new things um, based on limited data. So we're going to try and find a better way to make that easier for us. But I would say that lift compared to as a parent, I think that is that is every day. The families that reach out to me, whether they come here or they're reaching out for a second opinion, they're struggling with that, not just every six months when I see the people, they're doing it every day. And so I'd say, yes, it's a struggle, but it's one that I think the families live with, the community advocates live with every day. Um, and sometimes a little bit of stress pushes us to, to try things and to speed things up. And I think over the long term, um, I think that's a good thing. 
Yeah, I do too. I think the guidance is a is certainly as we develop it over the years, and we'll do another guidance maybe a few years from now, just to bring us all up to the same level playing field, so that we understand both the challenges, uh, the enormous amount of knowledge that had been gained in the interim, but also the challenges we face. I can't thank you. I hope you'll be with us in the next iteration of the guidance. And um, thank you, Chet. We, I, I'm from Cincinnati, um, born and raised there, went to Cincinnati Children's. And I know that that's such an amazing center. And I appreciate you and all of your colleagues knocking down the barriers so that we can treat these young men and these young women who are carriers in the best way possible and certainly convince the FDA that there is a surrogate marker that we can track and that we know and that we can move rapidly on the advancement of new medicines. So thank you for joining us. And I know we'll be seeing you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.